Hello, everybody. My name is Hayden Sowellin, Chief Executive of the EWC, the Education Workforce Council, from Hound Pau. It's my absolute pleasure to introduce you to and welcome you to this year's professionally speaking event by the EWC. Um, this year, we have Mr. Michael Fullen delivering the lecture for us. As I say, it's an absolute pleasure to welcome Michael, albeit virtually, to Wales. I'll shortly hand over to Professor Alma Harris, who's going to be the compare for the event today. Before I do, my role is literally to deal with some housekeeping issues for you. I'll do that nice and quickly so we can get uh, underway with the actual lecture itself. So firstly, could you keep your, your microphones and your cameras off, please? Um, so the usual practice there. We will have a full chat facility operational today. So if there's any thoughts that you have while Michael is speaking, please pop those in the chat. Similarly, start to put your questions there as well. We've got a team at EWC that will start to collate those questions and uh, they'll be ready once we get to the Q&A bit of the session. In terms of translation, again, if you want to pop any questions into the chat in Welsh, feel free to do so. And when Alma gets to the Q&A, if you want to ask any questions verbally in Welsh as well, feel free to do so when we've got a translator. If you want Michael's slides in Welsh, you can also do that. Um, the way in which you do it differs ever so slightly depending on your device, whether it's a laptop or a computer or a tablet, but basically use the shared screen option and follow the options through to EWC and then Michael Fullen. Today's event will be recorded. We've had quite a number of asks about that one, and we always record our events. It'll be on our social media and YouTube channels in a couple of weeks' time for you to watch again and share. And we are using social media today, so we'll be popping some things on Twitter. Feel free to do so. Um, we're at EWC CGA and um, use the hashtag there, EWC events. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Alma and intern Michael. Hope you enjoyed today's event. Thanks, Alma. Over to you. Thanks, Hayden, and, and welcome everyone to this uh, very special event. Um, I have the job of introducing Michael Fullen. Well, how do you do that? Uh, I'm not going to read his CV, but I am going to give him a very warm Welsh welcome. So thank you, Michael, for being here. It's, a, it's another Swansea University and EWC joint event and we've had so many successful events. This is the, the latest in, in, in a huge number of very, very successful uh, talks. So Professor Michael Fullen, a uh, huge pleasure and privilege to introduce you. Thank you so much for giving up your time to be with all of us on the call, over 200 of us on the call here this evening. As I said, how do you introduce Michael Fullen? Well, I, the main thing I want to say about Michael is as we all know, he is a global expert on educational change, leadership and improvement. He, um, I'm very happy to say he's both a colleague and a friend. We've both worked in the field of educational change for over 30 years, more years than I care to remember. And it's Michael's work really that inspired me to think about what forms of change really bring about large scale improvement in different countries. Michael's latest book, which I've had the privilege to see an early copy of, is called Principle to Zero. And it's very much a story of leadership and it's very much a story of, of localized change. And I think one of the things that makes a direct connection, I know Michael will speak about this at length, is the importance of school-based change and community-based change and the importance of, I guess, driving change. I hate the phrase from the bottom up. Um, there will be opportunities for you to ask questions. So if you put questions into the chat as, as Michael is speaking, I will take note of them and do my best to uh, ask them if they're in the chat. But I will also give you the opportunity to ask Michael directly some questions at the end of this presentation. So Jochen Bauer, Michael, thank you so much for being uh, with us all here this evening in Wales. And uh, I'm going to hand over to you, and we're hugely looking forward to what you have to say. Uh, thank you, Ahmed. It's, it's a privilege also to be introduced by you. Uh, we do, don't have enough time to be in the same room or in the same universe sometimes, it seems. So it's great, uh, and, and especially this occasion. I, I don't say this to every group. I can guarantee you that, that 
I think there's something uh, in 2023 that's different and potentially, and I use that word carefully, augurs good system change for those who are in shape to initiate it and push it. Uh, this is different uh, right now, this month. And uh, we have, uh, I work with a group of about 10 of us. We mix and match on two kinds of things. One is system change, really what we're talking about today. And the other one is deep learning, which are the six global competencies and networks of schools to put those systematically into place. Those two things feed on each other. And I, I've, I either participate or follow certain systems from uh, sizing them up in terms of, are they going to be in any position to bring about positive system change? And I think, and I mean this sincerely, is that Wales has the possibility of uh, being one of the leaders in that domain if they can get the bottom-up, middle-mobilized, uh, the center, of, I'll, you'll, you'll see me give a slide later, intrigue the center, the top, uh, so that the relationships across those levels are really crucial. And I think when I compare the, the, the countries where I'm connected with, we are big in California. California is big in its own right. Uh, we're working, for example, with San Diego County, which has uh, 500,000 students. It has 42 districts, just the one county. Uh, and uh, California has massive money, billions, putting into change, uh, into bringing about these changes. But they don't have a, uh, you need a good, you need good resources. You need a good plan. They sort of have that with their community development. But then you also need good relationships, which they haven't worked enough at. And I think you've worked at relationships. So I think uh, uh, good plans plus good relationships plus good ideas are really what uh, what we need. So California, we're our whole team is there all the time, lots of times. Look for it because I think there's some good things happening there, but it's also very complex and has a number of weaknesses. So I won't go through a whole bunch of countries, but others that are, uh, let's say, worth looking at, Scotland, uh, back and forth. I've been working with one of the alliances there. Uh, Ontario, obviously, where I'm based, which did is kind of on a downswing, but we hope will be an upswing soon. Australia, New Zealand, and even England might be uh, uh, showing more uh, presence in the next two years uh, as I get more and more connections there. So enough about all of that background. Uh, let me then uh, turn to, I, I have a slide deck. It's, I, I, I'm glad to say it's going to be, tra is translated into Welsh. So let's take a look at the uh, this slide deck. It's available to you. Uh, and I will uh, kind of, uh, I, I tried not to have a whole bunch of slides, but I wanna say one main thing. This is about what's happening on the ground in the good places. 80% of our best ideas come from, uh, from practitioners, uh, but now we're talking about practitioners who are committed to system change. Uh, we're increasing that. So that's why how we want to frame it, uh, frame it. I know you'll ask a lot of questions. We have uh, on my website, we have a lot of videos recently and other things of that. So a lot of resources, but let's get right to it. Uh, leadership for Transforming Educational Systems. Uh, I, I just did, a, you wouldn't have seen it necessarily, but I did a two-part op-ed in the national magazine of uh, in the U.S. called Ed Week. Uh, one was uh, January uh, 9th, 9th, I think it was, and the other is uh, earlier this week. And in both those, the first part was, why hasn't the system changed in 200 years where we've had this system and it doesn't show signs of really big change on any scale? Uh, so that was one, part one. Part two was, uh, what is it going to take to change the system? So some of that is built here, but read those two uh, op-eds. They're on my website. You can get them directly on uh, from almost anywhere in the media. So let's go into uh, a couple of things, as frame it. I call it the battle of the paradigms. Uh, the paradigms, uh, it's an interesting thing. On the right-hand side, I called it the bloodless paradigm because a lot of the uh, ideas were... Uh, didn't have humanity in it, basically, is what way of putting it. Uh, some of my team don't like the word bloodless, so we're thinking of changing it to laissez-faire, which uh, apparently has less blood. But laissez-faire is, is also a good topic because it really says that the reason that we haven't had much change is that there's been a laissez-faire attitude, let's say, for the last 50 years, where we know the data quite well, 
uh, where where there's hasn't been system action that would accomplish system change. So I'm going to call that less a fair. It's not negative. It's just uh, uh, just to kind of uh, just not activating enough of the levels, and you can't get change just by being a change agent yourself. You have to mobilize others. So we have settled on the humanity paradigm, which is deep care and commitment to living things. Uh, the last book I did is called Spirit Work, where we basically I basically said because I was working with a number of districts that were like this, I basically said that the systems that are getting somewhere have moved on from moral purpose, which was literacy, numeracy, high school graduation, uh, which is still good to have as a foundation, but it's not good enough. And they've moved on to that, what uh, what I think is a much uh, deeper sense of uh, spirit work is about the improvement of humanity. Spirit work is about improvement, improvement of everything that lives. Uh, that is the planet, the whole thing. So this is really fundamentally about what the human spirit and uh, evolution is about. And I think probably there's more people aware now these days about uh, human spirit and human evolution, more percentage of the population. And we are, in, we are actually in our deep learning work uh, developing students who through the six competencies, uh, uh, citizenship, uh, uh, character, and, uh, and uh, compassion, all of those things, uh, that they have been, they are developing their moral purpose not only individually, but also uh, in uh, in groups. So here's uh, here's one way of just putting some things in the humanity paradigm that I'm talking about: purpose, belonging, and contribution. Uh, it's, it seems strange to say this, but the education, public education system, has not had much purpose beyond academic obsession for a long time, and that's too narrow. Uh, but so the newer purpose is individual, group, society improvement. The, the global competencies we work on, uh, the coping, uh, developing people individually in a combination who can actually cope with and, uh, and thrive on complexity. Uh, here's something that I think you should think about. I think you should be re relating to it, identifying with it right away, uh, which I, when I think of, of the transformation that we're talking about, we've been aiming for for the last 30 years, but certainly for the last three years, uh, as we get beyond the beyond the pandemic, is that the changes that I'm engaged in, where I think are the most promise, are those systems, and you're one of them, where there's a lot of local uh, driven, this is at the local, I mean, at the school and community level, I mean, at the local authority level, that there's a powerful cohesion and, and uh, sense of drive there. That that drive is buttressed by lateral linkage within the region, but lateral linkage across the country. Uh, that and that it's system leverage. Who should do system leverage? System leverage is too important to leave to system leaders. So system leverage is the responsibility of local, of the middle, which are the local authorities, and of the government. That's a that's it's a participatory act. So that think of the system. Uh, systemness is what we call it. I don't have to dwell on this one. Uh, traditional schooling boring. We've got data, all kinds of data that show that to be the case probably two thirds of students by the time they get to year 10 or 11 are either alienated or bored. Uh, the uh, inequity, inequality uh, has been widening for 50 years. If you read the uh, the, uh, the economists that have been tra tracing this, especially the women economists like uh, Mariana Mazzucato, uh, the world is troubled uh, both, uh, both in terms of social as well as climatological. And that uh, we want, we think, uh, uh, the deep learning is showing promise here. This is a good way of putting it. The future is up for grabs. When I first put this slide up, uh, I think it was two years ago, I said the pent up ideas are waiting to be uh, pounced on. And I was just thinking good ideas. But now I realize that a lot of the spin offs are not good for humanity and that the pent up ideas are people are taking action that's not necessarily going to make for system improvement. So we have to have the good action. Uh, the battle of the decade is the good action. One of our colleagues, Jal Mehta, you possibly know him as a sociologist from Harvard, did a great book uh, with Sarah Fine on deep learning about two years ago, uh, where in it, where they had studied uh, across the U.S. secondary schools, was there much deep learning going on? They selected schools that had reputation for being deep learning. They went there. They found very little. They, that's why they called their book In Search of Deep Learning after they did their work. But they also said there were snippets of it snippets of it that we ourselves are leveraging now. 
But their main conclusion was, and I like their phrase, the yawning gap between how schools are organized and how young people learn and how they want to learn. And I won't read all these uh, bullets. You have a chance to look at those. But the things, the way the schools are, are uh, traditionally organized, they do not link to the life of students, to the life that they want, the life that they have. And, and that's the connection we're trying to make. Uh, we have, I did another op-ed, it's this one, you can find it in the same, uh, my website, uh, michaelfullen.ca is a website, www.michaelfullen.ca, uh, that the students are change makers. Students are the only ones who, uh, say born since 2000, who've only grown up digitally. Uh, and that's the group, but they're the ones that are going, some of them going to be alive in the next century. And so we really have organized our deep learning to think of partnering with students of all ages. And I would say, I, we haven't found a, a student young enough that's not, not a change agent potentially. I'm talking three years old, five years old, but certainly uh, eight, to, eight to 18 or whatever. So changing the system so it's uh, bottom up. This gives you a flavor. Do read the uh, op-ed, these six points about it, uh, that, uh, that these, are, these are really where the resources are. I don't mean students on their own doing this. I mean students uh, partnering with each other, partnering with uh, with the teachers and others in uh, in the wider domain. I'm just going to show you a, a a clip here. I think it's probably two minutes long. Just a sample out of a whole bunch of ones we have. This is from a school, a secondary school in um, uh, just north of Toronto in York Region. It's called Big Bill Hogarth Secondary School. It opened about six years ago, so it's now got its full complement. Uh, it started with us, uh, with the six E's. And if you go to their school, physically, you'll see on the pillars of the school, big, large letters, the six C's uh, stated there from, uh, from character to citizenship, to collaboration and communication, to creativity, to critical thinking. And then, and this is typical of what they're doing. And I want you to notice this. Uh, this is the beginning of uh, interviewing four students in the secondary school. It's a school district that has a very large district. It has uh, about 80, 80 to 85% visible minority, but they're, uh, and they are, uh, they're somewhat moving into the middle class. So it's a somewhat prosperous, but, but major uh, domain. And with this, uh, what they do is they, they have deliberately with us, but mainly without us because they are, they're there every day. They have created a whole school that's uh, mobilized for students as change agents. So I wanted to give you a flavor of this. This is the, a teacher interviewing four or five students one by one. I'm just going to show you the first one to give you an idea of what I'm talking about. So let's listen in. Hello, York Region District School Board, educators, support staff, and system administrators. My name is Mamtha Sivapada Syndrome, and I am an educator here at Bill Hogart Secondary School. First off, I would like to start off by thanking all of you for taking the time to listen to our students as they engage in a conversation related to creating equitable, inclusive, and identity-affirming learning environments. Our leadership students here at Bill Hogart Secondary School are well aware of their role in contributing to a respectful, helpful, and compassionate local and global community. So today, I'd like to start off by engaging in a conversation with all of you. And to start off, my first question for you is, you are all change makers. You've made a positive impact in your school community and sometimes beyond. What can students do to help to create change within their school community? What can staff members do to help create the conditions to help students create and engage in social change? I think I'll answer that question. I'm Cameron Davis. I'm a grade 12 student here at Bohogarth. And I think when it comes to my activism pathway, my activism career, it started back in grade 10. It, I did a speech at a mark on Black Lives Matter protest. I posted it on YouTube and it went viral. I think that when it comes to being a change maker, it's all about saying what you believe in, speaking from the heart, and making sure that everyone that you're talking to, everyone that you're trying to address in your story is someone who's gonna listen. So when it comes to students, I wanna make sure that they know that 
have your teachers listen to you. You're in the right, you know your perspective, you know what you're gonna be talking about, and it's up to the teachers to be willing to listen, to be willing to learn from it, and then act upon it afterwards. When I was in grade 10, I had to speak about, um, it was a history class, and I had to speak about the settlers and how we defined them, the tone we used to address them. And my teacher was using a very passive tone. They were using settlers, and I had to speak. I spoke out and I said, they're not settlers, they're colonizers. That terminology that we're using, that tone we're using is very important when we're talking about these issues. And they embraced it, they were acceptive of it. And it, it, was, it was a progressive sense of change. And all teachers need to be like that, where they're not defensive, where they're not worried about what the classroom will think or they won't act different like that, where they're not defensive. Okay, so that's, um, worried about there are about almost a thousand schools in that, uh, or a thousand students in that school. They're all like that. Students take leadership courses that are required one in grade nine or 10 and one in grade uh, year 11 or 12. And they're collectively talking like this all the time. They have embedded this kind of work in it. And it's uh, it's fantastic. So the slide, this next slide I have is kind of the summary, I guess I will say. It's very much what I used in the most recent book. The book, as Alma said, is called uh, Principle 2.0. Uh, it's coming out uh, in, in the mid-February, so it's imminent. And I organized that book around uh, school principals that we knew in different countries that were really doing good work and that we uh, we tried to bring out that work through those examples, but also I surrounded it with what the other research was saying. And I think the summary of it for me, I'll show you a diagram in a moment, is it is about spirit work. It's the humanity paradigm. It is about contextual literacy. Everybody striving to understand the culture in which they are working whatever that culture is in terms of its diversity, in terms of its values, in terms of what it is. Contextual literacy is a prime skill of leaders. Systemness, that att attention to realizing you're in a system and trying to influence it for the better. And another new one, connected autonomy, I prefer over collaboration because connected autonomy recognizes the individual, which is autonomy. Autonomy is good, isolation is bad. Connection is great if you're, have, if you're purposeful. So in di diagrammatic format, this is what it looks like. Uh, these uh, three things, lead learners, I wanna say something about that because it's so fundamental. Uh, by learners, I, you can see I mean students as well. So it's not just the hierarchy of learners, but think of it this way. Learners in this work have to have two characteristics. One is they have to model what learning is. They have to be contextually literate, for example. So they're there being prime examples of good leadership modeling it. But the other thing they have to do, very important, is lead, uh, lead learners have to develop other leaders while they're, while they're still leaders themselves. Another way of putting it is that at the end of your tenure, if you've been a leader for five, six years, that you when you end, you not only have had an impact on student learning and student life, but you also have left more leaders behind who could carry over, carry on even more than you did. So it's about your own leadership, exemplary. It's about developing other leaders from day one of your participation. And then it's about leaving in a way that there's forward momentum. In spirit work, uh, this is the definition. You, you have these slides, so I'll let you think about that. I've already mentioned it enough to talk about it. Uh, one of the great pioneers in system leadership, you probably know, is Meg Wheatley. Uh, she did the forward in our book and immediately said uh, uh, that uh, spirit work is the essence of the work that she's been talking about for almost 50 years. It comes alive in this book. It's what we're carrying forward in our, our uh, future analysis that we're doing now with other systems. And contextual literacy, uh, uh, a phrase that actually came about in my work with Brendan Spillane, who's a, a, a sports consultant and a business consultant in uh, WA, Western Australia, and he says contextual literacy is the uh, both the knowledge you have of the context in which you're working and the commitment you have to understand it deeper. Uh, uh, we have someone said, you see that third one down, uh, be an apprentice and an expert in your context. Uh, you, you're there, so you, uh, you, you, you're there to learn. Uh, you may be learning more from students than you are from uh, books on change or whatever. So that, that learner part is there, but also you, you better be accumulating good knowledge and then being proactive about it. So there's a real pro propensity here to be grounded, to be committed to improving the setting in which you work. Your setting is your local authority, if you're at the, the local authority level, 
uh, it's your school if you're at the school level. Systemness, we uh, a bit of an odd word, but I think we're finding more and more uh, comfort in it, even among young people. Uh, Peter Senge, the one of the founders of System Work, uh, often says that young people are natural system thinkers. They think of uh, you know, what could be, they think of uh, 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 the parts and the connections. So I'll say more about our conclusion about systemness later uh, in, in this. And then the connected autonomy, these are just continuing to do the uh, uh, the, the uh, basic concepts, laying them as a foundation. Think about, uh, I did a book in 2019. I know some of you will know it's called uh, Nuance. Again, I featured a number of district examples of uh, nuance is, is reading between the lines. Nuance is trying to get at uh, the subtleties that uh, bring out new things that you can't see. Uh, Leonardo da Vinci is a good role model for nuanced uh, production, let's say. And again, I'm not going to uh, read these five bullet points, but they are all about uh, uh, that. This is why good leaders, they can't read a book and, and then become a good leader because they don't understand and have the nuance of the setting in which they work. It requires experiential learning. It requires an openness to it. And so all of these examples are in the uh, in the book on on, um, on the principle, for example. And I pick up gems when I do these things, uh, learning from the field, uh, all my good uh, uh, phrases that I some people attribute to me, uh, I got by being in a given group in a given country and, and hearing somebody express it. Maybe not the way it would have been expressed by other researchers, but perfectly as a practitioner. And this is one that just came up recently in the uh, the the book, uh, we, the newest book, I guess I'll put it that way, that I'm just doing with Joanne Quinn, which is called The Drivers, and uh, and the the it's human paradigm in action, and it's it's a school in um, northern England uh, called Ben Adler School, and in it they've done fantastic. It was the worst school in the uh, almost in the country. It was down in the bottom handful of bad schools uh, when they when. Uh, uh, Mary Claire Brotherton, the principal, came along, hired this uh, assistant uh, uh, whose name is Sam Coy. And when I was just interviewing them for the new book, uh, this is what Sam said. And uh, it's such a good insight. I hope th this is really so, uh, here, here's, uh, here's the way I put it. A concept I really like right now for our work is specificity without imposition. We don't have enough specificity. So that's why the vague concepts, you know, be a you know, be a, a contextual leader. If it's just at that level, you can't pick it up. So we 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 have those, we can't keep it vague, but if you try to then uh, operationalize it and then you say, okay, I've got the definition, please follow and do it carefully, you're imposing it. So we're finding our best change strategies are to get people interacting, get them focusing on important things that are that they know about and to pull out with for themselves and with others, the specificity that they themselves embrace, in other words, without uh, without imposition. And this is what he said. I think it's brilliant. He said, you, you can only build trust by engaging the community. And leaders get this wrong when they first try to be aspirational, big vision, and they haven't worked enough on the relational part. Start with relations and go to aspiration. Perfect. perfect. It's, it makes to so much sense. And you see it in, in action. And here's a practitioner who knows more about it than most professors of uh, of leadership, I guess I'll say, because he gets at that specificity. Uh, here's another one coming from, actually this one is from Marie Claire Bretherton, who I mentioned was the principal through this turnaround. And this is a, a little more long, uh, lengthy, I'm not gonna read it in detail, but basically she, she said, this is about humanity, her success, which I have documented in both the, uh, the book, uh, Nuance book, the 2019 book, and in the New Drivers book that's coming out in uh, June, uh, that there, when you hear her talk, she is talking about, we have to, as leaders, uh, go through the humanity development and, and the throw up throws of how difficult it is in, the, in, in this dimension these days. We have to live that if we're going to relate to the parents and students who are living it in their lives, and if we if we don't identify it that way, we won't be able to be very specifically helpful. And you see it there. Uh, this one, um, I'm I'm not. I just want to leave this with you because it's uh, it's systematic. And it's uh, I don't want you to think about it too analytically. But when you think of a local authority, I think I forget you have uh, 
24, uh, whatever your number of local authorities are, uh, we think of intra-school collaboration as part of the puzzle inside the school, the collaborative culture. We think of inter-school, schools learning from each other, another part of it. We think of the relationship between the local authority and the school, which uh, we, we call the degree of district level uh, teamness. Uh, uh, and then that's just within the district. And we think of also the way that schools uh, and, and local authorities work together in a sense of we, not we, they, but we, we, and not just leaving each other alone, but connected autonomy. So that's just an abstract way of putting it, but it covers the waterfront. So I'm going to just give you um, literally about uh, 60 seconds. I'll be talking a lot for the last 20 minutes. Uh, just make a note to yourself. Uh, if you're with a small group, you could do it with the person beside you. Given what I've said, what's the single best or two ideas that connect with you? And what questions do you, do you have on your mind? 60 seconds, and I'm going to build on this. Then we'll come back at the end with the chat questions. Okay, let's come back and build on this. I, I want to make a point that just become clear in our work in the last uh, 10 months. Uh, and it's been when we focused on the school principal and uh, rising from, from COVID, when we focused on sometimes the school district vis-a-vis -vis the larger system. And this is it. I'll start, I'll do it in terms of the principal. One of the things that actually has been a good byproduct of COVID, a bit perverse to think of it that way, but a good byproduct has been that parents and students and teachers are more aware of the bigger picture. They're just more aware that uh, that there's connections here and it's out there. So that makes them potentially available to think more broadly in this work. And when you then begin to work on the meaning of that, uh, here's the way I would put it. I think I put it actually in this latest uh, Ed Week um, op-ed this way, is that you have a chance now to take into account the bigger picture. If that is done by leaders at the district and the state level who don't have this system sophistication that I'm talking about, it will become, and this is the phrase I used in the op-ed, hierarchical hell, because they will be making decisions and the decisions will not be grounded enough. They won't know enough about that. So that's uh, that's the one side of it. The other side of it, though, is if they have the right kind of leadership who cultivates local leadership, it becomes a system development opportunity. And this is what we are seeing. You'll see it in the book on the principle. And let me give you a definition of the role of the role of the principle that comes from this. And namely, it's this: that the new role of the principle post-COVID what we're trying to build in system change is that they their main role is to develop the internal system. Think about that. Their main role is develop, it, develop the internal system. If you're at the school level, the internal system are the students, the teachers, and the parents. And the more you develop the internal system, the more you have both political and professional power to be an influence for system change. You really have to get that internal system coherent. I would apply the same logic to the local authority. Now we're stepping up a level. And I'll say the main role of the local authority and the school leadership is to develop an internal system of the local authority who can then have their act together, who can be more effective when they play, when they relate to the larger system. And it's not that they, excuse me, become more effective and then leave the, and don't pay attention to the top. No, they actually, become more effective and they become proactive upward. A lot of my system change thinking has uh, made a transformation since 2013, when we did the work in Ontario, very successful, literacy, numeracy, high school graduation, 5,000 uh, students, uh, 5,000 schools, I should say. Uh, we had 72 districts and it was very successful. You can look at the measures, we know that. And then in 2013, after we had done that, I thought, well, we, we have solved the problem because we just knew how to do it. We made those priorities, we partnered with the locals and we got it done. But then I think, uh, I will say now, uh, uh, I'm, I was probably uh, overconfident based on a single case for two reasons. One is it turns out, it's not just literacy, numeracy and high school graduation, it's the six C's. It turns out it's more complex now to deal with the social degradation and the climatological degradation 
than than it was in 2013. So the, the system has shifted uh, very much from from that period of time, and that's why we have to think about it uh, uh, differently. So now I think we have the the opportunity to really observe that instead of go, getting from the top down, and there's two comp. The other reason the top doesn't work so effectively is there's changeover of leaders uh, every four years, six years, whatever. You can't count on it for sustainability. So the sustainability has to be built in to the local school, linked well, quite well with the local authority, linked in turn laterally with local, other local authorities and hierarchically with the center. That's what you're trying to do, is to have that as a coherent, I would say influence upward, but multifaceted part. And I, I, I say go for it because that's where the deep change is going to be accomplished in the next three or four years. That this is this is building up the local systems upward so that the overall system is more effective. So uh, we can look at this a lot of different ways. I'm not going to give you, but now I'm saying the uh, the shift is towards thinking of system change as bottom and middle up. I'll give you another diagram on that uh, later. Bottom and middle up, not uh, not top down, or not just kind of everything's related to everything else. Uh, systemness is that uh, making the divide, and then uh, this next slide, I just want to I'm going to stop and dwell on it a little bit because it is about the uh, uh, the definition I want to talk about. Uh, here's the way of thinking: instead of thinking from the top down, get the policy right, get support, implementation, think of it as the bottom up, and it's these are the uh, interactive phases. Build the unengaged, unengaged base. That unengaged is students who are alienated, is communities that are not well connected uh, uh, to each other or to the school. Uh, the base is really the local. Mobilize the middle, which are the local authorities in relation to the base and in, in relation to each other. And then this new phrase that I used last month for the first time, uh, it's a bit playful, uh, intrigued the top, but I, I think it gives you the, uh, the license. Uh, to be for the top to say what intrigues me about what's happening now in the local authorities and the local part. Now that we're in the midst of our change, what is it that intrigues me for better or for worse? Or if you're the opposite way, how do I intrigue the top to be more engaged in this? So this is where we get into what I call change agentry, uh, that uh, these are just some, um, I guess, elements that I would say we've learned over the years. I want to I want to do highlight these because uh, they're putting together what we've learned over a 15 year period. Uh, practice impressive empathy, uh, learning from others who are different from you. Impressive empathy, I don't think anybody else has used that phrase, but I have, and this is what I mean by it. Impressive empathy is when you have empathy and understanding and maybe compassion for people who are in your way. That's why it's impressive. Because if we don't figure out how to, how to relate to other people. And I don't mean extreme uh, destructive people. They might, might be in that mix. But a lot of, a lot of people uh, mean well or could mean well, and they get lost in the disagreements. So I'm saying as a leader, one of your main uh, goals is to think about those individuals in your, uh, in your realm of interaction who keep getting on your nerves or keep doing the wrong things or that. And start to think about what is it that makes them tick? What is it that they could be different to their with their peers or different with us. What impressive empathy do I need to know in order to link that person into them? What can I learn from them as well as how can I influence them? It takes patience to change minds. Yes, of course. Uh, say fewer things and say them more often. This is really good advice, uh, we think, from that. Uh, people who keep saying a whole bunch of things all the time and adding and adding and adding. It's a, we call it a strive for complexity and end up with clutter. Uh, stay the core things. They're important. Stay with them. Make them interconnect. And then uh, help all those who are with you to become more precise, what I call the specificity by the uh, imposition. And then expand your circle of allies, uh, because this is how you get system change from that. So uh, make the internal system the driver. The internal system is the school, the community, the local authority. The driver vis-a-vis -vis the external system, which is the region and state, uh, think of that as the flow. Those, if you're at the at the at the region or state level, think about how you can partner with other levels uh, so that the influence is coming upwards the way we've described it. 
the new agenda, and I didn't, I'm actually not presenting a lot of detail about our deep learning work, uh, the, but it is based on this notion, engage the world, change the world, students and teachers engaging the world. It's individual and social development. Actually, it's individual, small group and social development. It's about well-being and learning. All, all that's, that is the new agenda. It's fundamentally different. It's a humanity paradigm, fundamentally different than the academic obsession agenda. And it's very important to think of that difference as where we're heading right now, where we need to head, and where we will get the energy of young people to be totally immersed in this and also learning a mile a minute and be fantastic change agents in their own right. Uh, this is the uh, one of my favorite authors these days is a, a, a guy who's done uh, was a school teacher and has done a lot of good work in California. His name is Jeff Duncan Andrade. He recently did a, a good book uh, called Equity Equality, based on his uh, in uh, you know immersive work in California. And I I, lo I love this second chunk here. A young person cannot be well if they are thriving in school while others around them are suffering. The system change work we are beginning to see and want to see now when we are uh, linking community development and school system in California as is their current uh, focus, and when we're link uh, linking those two things together is that you are, uh, we are striving for system change, not for individuals being more successful in the system, not that only, but for the system to be more accessible with their individuals. And we see this identity as a natural interest of young people, if you can get the right combinations going. We see it as the only way to get collective success and therefore individual success. And it's a, it's a revolution. And we are, uh, we're at the early stages of it in, in thinking of this through. It's a new purpose for education that's fundamentally different than the previous one. If you work and you get increases in literacy and numeracy, for example, that's a good thing, but it also is it's, it's improvement, it's not transformation. Transformation is when you do this, this is our core work in, uh, in the in new, new deep learning, that is you uh, combine, the deep learning are the six C's, the learning itself is around the new pedagogies that are particip participation, all kinds of good depth. Uh, they focus on equity and well-being, that the uh, that the assumption is that if you start that everybody's I, I'm going to say 70 percent of uh, most most uh, systems I know people are not doing particularly well. The 70 percent of people are not doing particularly well. Therefore, any changes will turn out to be and need to be a benefit of lots of people. Then it will feed forward on itself. The key to uh, uh, key to a prosperous future is how people link in. Uh, the humanity develop, uh, paradigm prevails. Uh, this is really about ch societal change, not just educational change. This is the arena that we see ourselves uh, being in now. Uh, the two is new books. Uh, the principal is uh, 2.0 uh, is coming out in February. The second one is uh, now done, but we're just developing the some of the uh, details of it for revision to come out in June. And then this is a, I'm going to put, this is a repeat of what I've said before, but I want to underscore it so much. And uh, the underscoring of it is to say, we really need to build the base of students in local community. If you do that, you've got a fantastic uh, projection into the future. You need to figure out the local uh, authorities. They have to be mobilized in a way that internally authority, they've got their act together. They have to be great partners with their schools. They have to be great partners with each other, local authorities across local authorities. And they have to be great partners upward to the top and vice versa. Intrigue the top. We think if the top uh, gets intrigued, we'll have a lot of things developing. I think that I, I really do mean this. When I think of Wales, I used to do a lot of um, workshops there. This was uh, 2010. Almost every year we were there uh, going across the country with these. I think now in 2023, the instincts that you had earlier about local autonomy uh, and the uh, and the impatience that the top might have had sometimes to put, go too far or not or not specific enough, those have been kind of uh, uh, refined. And that right now, I mean today, that the leaders who are listening to this of all ages 
that you are in a better position to be the best possible change agent as an individual, to be a very effective change agent with the groups that you work, and also to have an eye to system change for yourselves, for, for Wales, a change of the system that starts to look like this uh, diagram. And then lastly, our deep learning work, we celebrate this every 18 months or so. Uh, the next one is uh, the deep learning lab is in uh, Anaheim, California, where we are working massively across that. But this is the deep learning lab that brings together the 20 countries we're working with uh, and uh, very powerful. It's 80% practitioner based. It's the newest up. It's bringing it all up to uh, to the top. So this is, uh, I know we're going to get jump into here and have a good time for back and forth in the questions. So let me uh, uh, move my slides to the stop sharing and I'll uh, relate to Alma and we'll have a great conversation for the next half hour. Okay, thank, thanks, Michael. As always, there's a lot in there to unpack and, and a lot of new ideas actually. And, um, I, I could speak to you for the next half an hour, but that's that's not my role. So I'm going to ask, there are some questions in the chat and I will be asking you some of those. But before I do that, uh, does anyone want to ask Michael a question directly? And if you do, if you can put your hand up, I'll, I'll invite you to come in and, and ask Michael the your burning question. Um, I can see uh, James Collicott. I hope I've got that right. James. Hi there, yes. Uh, Michael, just want to ask, I mean, I, I I think everything you said is is absolutely incredible and, and being able to put words and ideas that we've thought about before but we thought about that contextual literacy and making the education system fit the culture that we're living in and I think I share the idea of a lot of people is how do you build that in an exam assessed academia system how do you build that into somewhere where we assess them based on just the ability to recall memory and potentially perform some longer writing. Thank you. Yeah, fabulous question. And I am uh, I could have talked about it, but I'm glad you gave me the opportunity now. Part of the transformation of learning that's in our model and in other people's is to replace the uh, test-driven assessment of outcomes with a assessment system that measures the things we're striving for. And I mean specifically. So for example, uh, because now it's quite well advanced, the um, in we have a partnership with the University of Melbourne with uh, Sandra Milligan, who's the head professor. And they have spent the last three years, and now we're in deep partnership, to replace the uh, end of high school exams with the assessment of the competencies that I'm talking about that we have six, they have four competencies, they're similar. And so now that this is the center of gravity is going away from the the uh, grades, their uh, their system of, uh, of of assessing literacy and numeracy only into these more qualitative assessments. The qualitative assessments though are sound and communicable. I can also go to Anaheim where we have a great partnership with the Anaheim Unified High School District. So there's about, I think, uh, uh, about 10 schools and they're just high school districts. They have replaced, and we're in partnership with them. They had done a lot of it before we joined in partnership last year. A lot of this uh, transformation I've been talking about, and they have developed and their version of it for say, the outcome, outcomes, uh, they call it a capstone project. So the capstone project is something that every student works on as they go through their high school and that they demonstrate what they know via their capstone, capstone devotion. It's highly specific. It's highly fundamental. It's highly about change. So I'm going to say that and this is why that we need to push policymakers, because it's really hard to give, give, give up the exams that seemed so uh, necessary, but are, are just an absolute diversion from what we need. And I think we have to replace it. You can't have, if a paradigm doesn't work, you can't just kick out the paradigm. You have to have a replacement. And uh, this is, uh, I see a revolution in the measurement of learning in high schools that are compatible with what I've described and are already underway, practically speaking, in applied situations. Okay, thanks, Michael. I'm managing both the questions in the chat and the ones that are appearing on my screen. So apologies if I get it in the wrong sequence, but I think 
I saw a hand from Chris Britton and Chris, you've also put a question in the chat to Michael about assessment. So Chris, do you want to ask your question? You're here, Chris? Oh yeah, I just couldn't unmute Alma, sorry. Yes, so, so following on from that question actually about this idea of exams as memory tests rather than anything else, um, what about the concept of, you, uh, of schools being accountable for the destinations of their pupils rather than their test results? Because that's the accountability system we have at the moment. And can we gear towards a system where pupils want to go in their lives? I'm head of a special school, and that's exactly what we focus on is the destinations of pupils and the next steps in their lives. And, and is that a possibility for schools? Uh, we, uh, probably. I think... Um... The this is in effect the changes that I'm talking about. The destination question is tricky a little bit, at least for me, because the destinations uh, are uh, unpredictable. You know that, and you've built in, I'm sure, in the way you do it, uh, that you're discovering the de definitions. You're not just not going to a destination you already know about. So I think I think the, the the question is how do you do that on a very wide scale, and how students, some students who won't quickly know their destinations. But in effect, that is the language that I would prefer. We are, we are the yawning gap between what students want and what students are faced with has to be replaced by some part of a pathway development where they will change their mind about their destinations, probably some of them, but they will, that's the kind of line of thinking about it. We are not producing widgets here. We're producing people who, uh, as long as they have the individual orientation, the collaborative orientation with small groups and commitment to society, those three things fused, then we can predict that that kind of thinking will produce it. So I think you're on the right track uh, from what you said, but I think the question is, uh, how, how, do you, how do we get it done for, uh, for all the schools in variations on the theme, in other words? Thank you. Thanks, Chris, and all that time with the BBC and you can't unmute, but that's that's another issue altogether. Um, if we can go to Gwaur Taylor, I hope I pronounced that correctly, Gwaur, and you may be asking your question in Welsh, and we do have a translator to help us out with that. So, Gwaur. Uh, thank you for a fascinating lecture, uh, Professor Fullen. I, I will ask my question in Welsh if I may. Um, Oedd y fi ddiddordeb mawr yn yr hyn o chi'n sôn amdano am y berthynas ar draws pob lefel a'r ymddiriedaeth na sydd ei angen er mwyn datblygu. Fi'n gweithio ym Mhrifysgol y Brystwyth, ond yn aelod o'r cyngor gyda'r cyngor gweithliadus, felly mynd y fi ddiddordeb yn, yn addysgwyr y dyfodol yn benodol. Felly sut i chi'n credu gallwn ni, ond hefyd dysgwyr, arweinwyr, gwneithwyrwyr polisi, felly pob un o'r heineg cymdeithasol na chi'n sôn amdano, helpu i wneud gweithio fel addysgwr yn yrfa fwy deniadol um, a chynaliadwy o ydyn felly. Diolch. Diolch. I'm hoping we're going to get a, a translated version of that question uh, for Michael so he can answer it. Thank you, Alma. The question is, um, thank you, Michael. I was very interested uh, in hearing what you were talking about, about the relationship across all levels and tiers and the trust that is required in order to be able to develop. I work at Aberystwyth University and I'm also a member of the Education Workforce Council. So I have an interest in the sense of the future in particular. Um, so how do we think that learners, leaders, policymakers, all of those tiers and levels that you talked about at the social level, how can we help to make uh, being educators a more attractive and sustainable profession. Thank you. Okay, so um, a big question, I think, if we, if we just start with trust, uh, you know this, but and it seems like a, an obvious thing to say, but it's not so straightforward. Uh, trust is almost entirely experiential. Uh, you can't, you can't uh, say, I, please trust me. People have to experience the trust with you. So you have trust is an outcome initially more than it is a precondition. And I think that's... Uh, that's the part that we have to interact. And a lot of our solutions are participating in learning almost all through the deep learning model. It's all based on people interacting with each other to increase their individual and collective learning. It's, it's all anti-individualism, I wanna say it, not really in a, in a negative way that way, but it's really pro-developing uh, people as they interrelate to other people, the belongingness, the accomplishments, the worry about the world and the way in which you grapple with that. So I think those, uh, those kinds of uh, experiences, they need to be thought of as trust building propositions. This is why I go back to concepts like specificity without imposition. That's a trust building change phenomenon because you're not imposing. And we find that 
uh, it's not imposing is not the problem. It's just that uh, you have to get people to experience and see that this is something to link. And the more you impose it, the more it gets in the way of even doing it, ironically. So I think once you start the interactive openness, once you start concrete, concreti concretizing it, like specificity, you can then sort it out. And that's what we have to be able to do is to have those, uh, those, those groups that are good collaboratively, but they're also good to be able to interact uh, with others and they they have a propensity to interact with others which we call connected autonomy great thank thanks michael um if i can go to some of the questions now that have been in the, in the chat for some time and i'm i'm going to invite uh pauline stephen uh to ask her question or if she doesn't want to ask it i'm more than happy to ask the question so pauline do, do you want to ask it Thank you, Alma. Hi, everyone. Hope you're all okay. Lovely to see you all and always a pleasure to hear um, Michael's reflections. Um, my question is around about accountability, Michael, I suppose. And I think we use accountability in lots of different ways and we talk about general accountability, but we also talk about it in a very managerial sense. And I wonder um, what your reflections are around about whether accountability damages trust and how we can build relationships of responsibility. So uh, thank you. And thanks to EWC for putting this on. It's always a great opportunity. Great. I'm glad you asked about accountability. Uh, Richard Elmore well, passed away, unfortunately, a few months ago. Uh, 2014, he said something about no amount of external accountability will be effective in the absence of internal accountability. That's how he put it. And it's still true if you can get the nuance of that statement. And that, that is to say, you definitely can use external accountability in a way that undercuts the possibility of real change. The more you misuse external accountability, the less real change will happen. That's the, that's the typical. But how do you get real accountability then? And you get real accountability by building in the kinds of cultures that when we think of accountability at the school or the local authority level, I think of, um, I think of transparency, I think of interaction, I think of specificity, I think of people uh, relating to the external world, I think of all of those things. And I put it this way in the principles book, the new one, uh, the, the principle that I'm talking about that I describe in that book doesn't have to worry about internal accountability because he or she is there. They're participating interactively all the time within it. So once you open it up to transparency, make sure there's specificity, make sure there's non-judgmentalism. One of the ironies of judgmentalism is when you judge uh, people, they close up and you don't, they don't hear you. When you don't judge them, but you also have transparency, you have, uh, you have interaction, you have peer, the peer culture is a great form of accountability as long as it's transparent and specific. So we have to get at the origin of the solution, not the macro uh, policy part, but the interaction of a collaborative culture that builds in specificity, transparency, openness, that where the, where the, uh, where the outcomes are known and discussed. And uh, it's true that accountability has gotten itself a bad name, but Wales has been one country that has uh, fought against the English version of that, as you know, from and got rid of it. So you have to get rid of whatever remnants you happen to have in Wales of that wrong-headed accountability. Thanks, thanks, Pauline. And I guess Scotland have also, I think, uh, been very instrumental in, in listening to those words, Michael. If I can move us on a little bit. Um, Ethne Hughes is, is here, uh, and hopefully, Ethne, would you like to ask your question, please? Yeah, basically, I'm trying to pack both accountability and qualifications into the same space, um, because frequently they do marry together um, in, in system terms. So what I'd like to ask, basically, is um, how we secure. I quite like the idea of uh, humane and bloodless. I really do like that as a, as a description. Um, how we secure a humane rather than a bloodless um, outcome in terms of an accountability framework for schools and colleges, as well as an exam system that serves the principle of equity, which is central to the curriculum for Wales. We're told 
it isn't possible to get a new qualification system that serves equity. It can serve equality, but not necessarily equity. So I'd be really interested in your thoughts around that. Thank you. Oh, good. These are tough questions. They're those questions of the day. And uh, I'm troubled by equity and equality because it's a ma mass massive uh, preoccupation of uh, California as well. And I think that uh, it's very complicated. So I don't want to be think I have an answer that uh, that just kind of trotted out here. But I would put it this way that um, that and this is why I go back to Jeff uh, Duncan Andrade, who's who's really been helping to take it apart, is I think one of the problems of equity and equality for that matter, is that it is uh, it has been siloed, is the way I would put it, that the equity solution uh, uh, that is proposed usually, and I, I don't know about your uh, investment in it, but if I, uh, if I take the US where I know the numbers, they have invested massively financially in equity and equality since uh, for the last 50 years. And it's gone down, it's gone negative. Uh, so the money isn't the solution by itself. So I think, uh, I think that's one way of putting it. The other way where I see a lot of uh, hope in it is, uh, and we have we have this actually now in a project, a niche, big initiative in San Diego, where I mentioned I mentioned the five hundred thousand students, the fourteen districts. The project they, uh, that we are working on with them that just started uh, ten months ago is to reduce poverty and increase equity and equality together combination over the next five years. Uh, so deliberately reducing poverty in those uh, those communities. So I think uh, uh, I think. We have to really see and, and realize that those that aren't doing well, it's got to the point where the whole system deteriorates if that problem isn't addressed. It's not just social justice for those people. It is, but it's also the case that the whole system will deteriorate. And I, I also get mixed up personally myself in the come back and forth on equity and equality. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm more inter interested, I guess, in outcomes than I am in, in inputs, although both. So inputs is you're supposed to, with equity, build up the inputs. I'm all in favor of that. But I want to see the results. And I have, we have a, a hypothesis we haven't fully proved yet, but here it is, that, uh, that those that aren't doing well in our, our system, those that are in difficult circumstances, students and families, whatever, that once they develop through deep learning, they actually do better than other students who uh, who seem to be doing better in the academic system. That, in other words, is not only law injustice through lost uh, development. That the kind of development uh, that that people who have had hardship, if they develop, they af actually turn out to be better at problem solving than those who sailed through. I put it that way. So I think uh, I think there's massive work being done, and I I. Uh, I don't think, uh, I think I would invest accountability. I would invest in the accountability of transparency as helping to solve this rather than the accountability of external tests. Great, thanks, thanks, Michael. Thanks, Ethne, for the question. If we could move a little further away from Wales uh, or Scotland uh, for the moment, and uh, if I can take you to Spain, um, where someone you know very well, Michael, Cecilia Azorin, Professor Cecilia Azorin, has asked a question, and it's very simply but profoundly this. Are networks a good example of bottom-up leadership today in education? Um, in, a, in a general sense, yes. Uh, I've only, um, I was with actually with Cecilia before the COVID uh, in, uh, in Spain, and uh, they, have, uh, they have a lot of networks uh, but but I would probably say, and she can speak for herself on this, that their networks are not very connected to each other. Like they're sprinkled all over the place. So they they can be successful as an isolated network, but the system doesn't get better because there's not any cohesiveness across that. So I think networks per se are not the issue, uh, but interaction is, purposeful interaction. And that whatever the system is, if you can get what I described earlier in this talk as the, uh, as People, uh, people coordinated within a network that develops the internal cohesion of the network, and in turn 
links to itself to other parts laterally and in turn turn uh, that there's some vertical learning going on that this is the uh, that so the so a, re, a more refined policy oriented system related uh, conception of network is uh, is essential and we can say this also by way of a problem if we take new zealand which probably you know as well as i do uh, that new zealand has uh, tripped over itself for i don't know 40 years uh, about uh, autonomy versus centrality so they keep wanting autonomy and then they say well we don't have enough focus so we better have networks they have networks which are voluntary the networks don't get very cohesive some do some don't but it doesn't contribute to the system so they've been cycling back and forth between the uh, uh, you know the imposition of the center trying to pull things together versus the local saying don't don't bother me don't don't interfere so even a small country like New Zealand hasn't solved this problem of the relationship between networks or collaboration and system change, not just a, a local success here and there, but the overall system being changed. So I think the networks, uh, the qualified yes, is as long as the networks are A, doing the right thing that we've been discussing, and B, are connected to other networks laterally and vertically in the country or in the region. As long as that's happening as well, but the network phenomenon per se will not be um, the answer. Okay, great. Th thanks, Michael. And, and again, moving closer to home, uh, Maureen, um, do you want to ask your question? Or I'm, I'm very happy to ask Michael the question. Okay, I'll, I'll ask the question on Maureen's behalf, behalf then. Um, and it's this, Michael, head teachers have power as change agents in working together in the local area with a focus on their communities and their and learning and teaching. But the question is this, how do we engage the local authorities in acknowledging this form of system change? What I've said so far about the uh, revision, my revision of the, of the role of the principal is that the role of the principal is to develop the internal system vis-a-vis -vis the external system. The internal system primarily to start with is the school and the community. That's that's what I mean, that that's contextual literacy. That's the internal system. Uh, I think then the next extension is if the local authority and the school level can team up, their job is to develop the internal system of the local authority, which includes all of its schools, vis-a-vis -vis the hierarchy or the, the center. So this is, uh, uh, you know, if you're in a bad local authority, you're better off trying to build your local, uh, your best version of the system at the school level, vis-a-vis uh, -vis the where the authority becomes the external. The ideal is the authority becomes the partner as well internally to help build that bigger system. That's the school plus the authority vis-a-vis -vis the policy context. So I think what we what I want to see is that it doesn't do much good for a school to stay autonomous, become a collaborative, et cetera. Uh, uh, and have a good good features. If it doesn't, if it's not sustained, we say you can you can build a collaborative school that's highly effective despite the local authority you're in, but you can't you can't sustain it despite the local authority because it kind of wears away at you. So I guess I'm I'm looking for pieces of partnership that bring wider uh, definition to the system involvement and the integration of it that we talk about. So. Uh, uh, Ideally, I want the local authority and the schools to figure out to what their system is, schools, schools, local authority, and all of that vis-a-vis -vis context policy, in order to be a more proactive, intriguing partner for the top. Great. Thank you. And, and apologies, Maureen. I, I gather you weren't able to unmute, and maybe that was the same for Chris, too. So apologies that we couldn't hear you. Um, I mean, I, I guess we... Uh, we'll go to an, another question that's been in the chat, and this is from Catherine Place. And I don't know if Catherine wants to ask her question, if she can unmute. If not, I'll just ask Michael it on your behalf. Thank you, Alma. I have unmuted. Um, Excellent. And thank you, Michael. I suppose I'm coming from the perspective as a head teacher in Wales. So uh, my question is around leadership, but it's actually more focused on those individual teachers within our schools. Um, and with the increasing pressure on recruitment and retention of our profession and many leaving the profession, 
how can we ensure teachers' well-being is supported so they too can thrive in this complex world? Uh, my overall system, uh, my overall comment about building the internal system includes support for teachers as part of that internal system. So I think you're, uh, I, I think we can center the solution on the notion that teachers are not receiving the right support, that too many are, are, are leaving, that the lack of support. And then I want to say, let's not jump to the policy level to solve this problem with a giant leap, do some of that, but let's figure out how the role of the principal and others, maybe local authority, can be also de uh, developmental vis-a-vis -vis the teacher. And we did, I'm, I'm in the habit of doing uh, op-eds now, and I don't like I don't do like a hundred of them, but I've done about half a dozen over the last 12 months. And I did one with a teacher leader uh, from Milwaukee. That's I like the I like it. She made a great contribution. It's called "Who's Abandoning Whom." So the you can see from that title, the question is: Given that teachers are leaving, uh, are uh, is it because they the system has ab abandoned them? Therefore, they'd rather do something else. Or is it because they're abandoning and they're giving up too easily? Like our, our rhetoric it really says the system is the problem and we have to change that. That's why people are uh, being abandoned or are abandoning. And so I think we have to uh, look at uh, differently uh, this combination. And one of the sentences we have in there uh, in, that, in that short article, which I like, I think was probably uh, Joanna's, uh, my partner's session, uh, phraseology, she said, we, let's look at who's staying, not just who's leaving, but who's staying. Why are they staying? And if you start to look from why are you staying, you will find the humanistic paradigm. That's what, that's what you're going to find. And then we have to expand the uh, humanistic uh, paradigm. So I think that if you treat the departure of teachers as an individualistic problem, it can't be solved. If you treat it as a relational problem, that uh, you need the system, what I call the build the system. And I've said, I don't want to build the system from the top down. And, you know, I think the top should be improved. I want to build it from the bottom middle up. So that 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 bottom middle, you can withstand all kinds of issues. And if you get the group working on the healthy development of a, of a, of a collegial culture that is responsive and, and doing well vis-a-vis -vis the goals of the system. So I think it's a huge problem. I don't want to say there's a theoretical answer that we just slickly uh, trot out here. But I think the issue is to uh, redefine uh, what teachers always, I think, wanted to be, which is to be a member of a profession where they're making a collective as well as an individual contribution to society and to their local community. And when, I think we have to rediscover that virtue of teaching. And it is it is a change in the teaching profession, which after all started off as a highly individualistic profession, one room, one class, one you know, one classroom, and one building, all of that stuff. And now, the best collaborative versions are the ones that have the features that I've been hinting at. And I don't mean you know putting a bunch of money into collaboration. I mean deeply, uh, kind of uh, collegial places that get results and get empowered to do that. So I think it's a big glitch, but I think it's something that if we can get this right out of the problems we've had, it will accelerate a lot faster. And in one of these, uh, one of these other, uh, uh, one of my final op-ed that I'm, I'm thinking of now about six reasons to be optimistic about 2022, that's when I wrote it, was that, uh, that teachers and parents and students are each other's best allies. So if we can get the school principal working on that alliance and the local authority liking that alliance, you have a building block that uh, reverses the uh, uh, reverses the trend towards departure of, of, uh, of people. Uh, and I think that it has to be seen as a uh, as a as a an opportunity to make a change. I was just thinking lastly here about uh, I was talking to the superintendent of Anaheim yesterday and he said, one of the things that uh, Gallup is finding in its work is that there's an increase in quiet quitters. Quiet quitters are, are employee, employees of the job who, uh, who just have given up, but they still kind of need the money and they're, they, ha they hang around in that. So I, I think we, we have to enliven the teaching profession 
so that is doing these collective things, not the individual things only, but the collective things that were, that really permeated what I had to say in the last hour. Thanks, Michael. I, mean, I think we're, we're getting towards the end of, of our time with you, and it's, it's been a, a huge pleasure to, to listen to you. And, I, and we've we've bombarded you with questions, and there are many more questions, some in the chat that uh, I know you've you've said that you would very graciously answer uh, in, in the next few days. Um, I guess one one final question, which is a very sort of Welsh specific question, and uh, this is not from anyone who's shared their name. Uh, don't read anything into that. And mm -hmm. it's about the new curriculum in Wales, which is is you know has been co-constructed by the profession, and it's uh, coming to realization now. And I guess the question here is based on your experience. What advice would you give to educators in Wales on how to successfully introduce this change, um, which is which is huge for Wales? And uh, I'll, I'll make this unnamed question the last one. It's, it's not from me. I, I, can, I can reassure yeah. you on that. But it's about the curriculum for change. Uh, sorry, it's about the new curriculum. And what advice would you give uh, colleagues currently in the position of trying to implement that curriculum and to realize it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't have a very good, uh, I don't, I know the question. I, I don't have a very good um, streamlined answer, but I, and I won't give you an elaborate um, either diffuseness, but uh, when, I, I'll just start by saying this is when I think of curriculum, usually I think immediately of pedagogy, not of the curriculum. So that, that's just my bias. I think pedagogy is way more important because it leads to better curriculum. And you know, in Scotland, they have curriculum for excellence. They had that as an alternative, still do but they never really worked it out uh, so that maybe now they're trying to, but after 10 years or whatever the number has been, you have a, a new curriculum and people spent a decade saying, what does it mean? Or what, how do we do it or whatever? So I want, I think my advice is to take the curriculum and focus specifically on the pedagogical goals of that curriculum and on the caring relationships, which is the well-being side and to implement it through well-being and learning, which is well-being and pedagogy for me, make sure it has that route to it. Uh, the curriculum as a solution in its own right, as an end in itself, will fail uh, because it's one thing, but there's not too many things. And if you add well-being and learning and the curriculum, you've just got three and make it make that the interaction uh, uh, at, at play. Okay, th thanks, Michael. Um, as I make my final comment and my thanks to Michael, can everybody on the call, um, normally what we do now is we give Michael a huge round of applause. So can we do it virtually by uh, the clapping hands symbol? Um, that would be, uh, I think, very, very, very sort of appreciative of what we've just heard. Um, two, two things that, that I've taken away, uh, strive for complexity and you end up with clutter. And I'm just thinking that maybe we need less policies and more uh, grounded change. Um, and I guess the humanity paradigm, uh, when we think about COVID and what our teachers, what our professionals did in schools, you know, we, 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 we redesigned, I suppose, our thinking around mm -hmm. what, what, what system change really is. And ultimately, I think the students as change makers is gonna be huge in the future. I mean, I've been privileged enough to work in Scotland and to listen to lots of young people talking about reform and change, and they're sensible, and they're, they're hugely, hugely enthusiastic of being part of that change. So, so more of that, please. And I guess my final plea to you, Michael, is will you come back to Wales physically so we can have this conversation in person? Well, I think on the last question, for sure, because I think you could be on the move. You could be a system. Uh... You spent a long time figuring out and being uh, figuring, not liking the uh, external authorities or your internal authorities enough. But now I think the, you've kind of uh, sorted out some of that roughness. And I think there's a collective will that can be mobilized. And that's what you yourself and others have worked on. So I'd say go for it with, uh, with my, uh, you know, build the base, mobilize the middle, uh, intrigue the top, have that as the, as the momentum. And I'll be there. Brilliant. I'll be happy to be there. Brilliant. Well, we, we will be happy to welcome you to Wales in person in the future. And I think you're absolutely right. I think that Wales is definitely 
a system on the move and uh, it's a collective system on the move that involves yeah. students, teachers, local authority. It, it is a collective system on the move. That's why so it has the potential. That's exactly why. Good. Thank you, Michael, for your time and your input and, and ev everything that you've shared with us this evening the, and answering all these, these questions too. We're, we're hugely grateful to you. So can I, uh, again, just say, you know, Dioffenwald, thank you very much for being here this evening. Thank you, colleagues who, you know, sat through this for the last hour and a half and asked fabulous questions. It's been a pleasure to have you here. And of course, to the EWC for hosting us, Hayden and colleagues, it's been a, it's been a huge pleasure. So as we bid you farewell, uh, have a good evening and uh, let's keep change happening in Wales.